Radio Westeros, Episode 61, The Winds of Winter Primer, Part 7, The Reach. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm your co-host, Yoke Boy, and with me is Lady Gwyn. Yeah, hi there, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. And in this episode, we continue to prepare you for the Winds of Winter with another installment in our Winds of Winter Primer series. This time, we're focusing on the Reach and the stories of Samuel Tarly and Aaron and Euron Greyjoy. These are characters we really haven't gone into detail with before, so we've got plenty to say, and we hope to get to the very hearts of the Greyjoy brothers. Yes, as terrifying as that might sound, these plot lines are intriguing. So to begin with, we'll recap Sam's final chapter in Feast, where he arrives in Old Town. Then we'll delve into the Winds of Winter sample territory as we analyse The Forsaken, where Aaron Greyjoy is our point of view in one of the darkest and most twisted A Song of Ice and Fire chapters to date. Next, expect a full-scale military analysis of the situation in the Red Wine Straits, where Euron Greyjoy is poised to face off with Paxter Redwine's proud fleet. What exactly is Euron planning here? We have plenty of fresh ideas to share with you all. And finally, we will be speculating on the possibilities for the Winds of Winter for chapters in the Reach. What will happen in Euron's later story? Who are the characters in the Citadel we need to keep our eye on, and why? What about Marwyn the Mage and that glass candle? And will Sam confront his father? There are so many exciting talking points we'll be discussing today. Mysteries, intrigue, and plenty of character analysis to get you thinking about the future of this story we all love so much. But before we begin, we want to give a shout-out to our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Daniel, Joel I, the Three-Eyed Bro, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Pepper Nix, Moltude, and John Wigarian. Yes, yeah, so thanks so much to all of our patrons, and if you enjoy today's episode, please consider being a patron and obtain perks such as shout-outs, early access, and now an invite to our Discord forum. Look for Radio Westeros at patreon.com to see what benefits you could obtain today. And now, let's begin this Winds of Winter Primer, Part 7, The Reach. They reached Old Town on a cold, damp morning when the fog was so thick that the beacon of the high tower was the only part of the city to be seen. A boom stretched across the harbour, linking two dozen rotted hulks, Just behind it stood a line of warships, anchored by three big drummonts, and Lord Hightower's towering four-decked banner ship, the Honor of Old Town. When Jon Snow was made Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, keen to exemplify true leadership, he attempted to solve multiple problems at once by sending Samuel Tarly, Maester Aemon, Gilly with Mance Raider's infant child passing as her own, and Night's Watch steward Darion on a journey to Old Town. Darion was to be a recruiter for the Watch, Aemon and Raider's child, both possessing king's blood, were being protected from Melisandre's flames, and Samwell was to forge the links required to become a maester at the Citadel and replace the elderly, frail and blind Maester Aemon. And from a character perspective, this manoeuvre set in motion a growth arc for our point of view Samwell. Away from the Brotherhood at the Wall, Sam has the opportunity to mature before our eyes and truly come of age. His first test of character comes in Bravos. Aemon has fallen gravely ill, and Darion is spending their collective coin on wine, women, and song. Samwell confronts him, angrily chastising Darion for breaking his Night's Watch vows, and a fistfight ensues. Here, Sam, the nervous coward we saw being bullied early on, is beginning to show the leadership qualities required to hold this mission together. 
Shortly afterwards, the loss of Darion, unbeknownst to Samwell at the hands of Arya Stark, gives Sam further freedom to find himself. On board Cinnamon Wind, bound for Old Town at last, Aemon dies after dreaming he was old, surely one of the most heartbreaking moments in the books. However, on a character arc level, this is a further call to action for Samwell. There is an essential void in the Night's Watch to be filled now, and the story requires a learned character who has the ability to overcome the threat from the others with wisdom, knowledge and intellect, which will be earned before our very eyes. While sailing over the open ocean aboard the Summer Isle swan ship captained by Kuhuru Mo, Samwell loses his virginity with Gilly, another sign from the author that we're witnessing a manhood arc on this journey. And on the subject of fat masts, Sam is also engaging in strenuous physical labour around the ship on this journey. With the addition of a fish and fruit based diet for weeks on end, and his black clothes noted to be baggy, perhaps we can expect to see a different Sam in more ways than one in the pages of The Winds of Winter. What Sam's character really needs in the latter stage of this growth arc, though, is a showdown with his abusive father, Randall, and there's every indication that George is steering us in that direction. We'll get back to this potential plot point later, as, first of all, Sam needs to sharpen his mind as a Westerosi intellectual and overcome the obstacles in his path at the Citadel. The final chapter of A Feast for Crows deals with the last leg of the long voyage south, as well as Sam's arrival at the Citadel. So why don't we recap those closing pages from Feast? With the opening line, the most perilous part of the voyage was the last, articulating Sam's thoughts on the ironborn longships said to be swarming the Red Wine Straits, important exposition is given to the broader situation in the Reach as part of the setup for Euron Greyjoy versus the Red Wine Fleet. The Ironborn, we learn, have capitalised on the absence of that fleet and seized control of a number of ports on the Arbour. Rhymesport, Vinetown and Starfish Harbour among them, and we're told that they are, quote, using them as bases to prey on shipping bound for Old Town. In spite of this, few enough longships are actually in evidence, though at one point the increasingly brave Sam, in contrast to his prior ineffectiveness at archery at the Wall, looses an arrow at one marauding longship which he thinks might have hit its target at 200 yards. Fortunately, Cinnamon Wind outpaces this brief threat, although there's no evading the many bodies floating in the whispering sound as they make their way towards Old Town. Observing wrecked ships in the water and burnt fields and villages ashore, Sam asks crewmate Zondo Duru, who would be mad enough to reeve so close to the city? The Summer Islander points to a banner in the sea never before seen, a red eye with a black pupil. Neither Sam nor Zondo relates the sigil to Euron Greyjoy, but attentive readers do. As they make their way along the coast, a galley named Huntress, flying the banners of the High Tower and Tom and Baratheon, pulls alongside Cinnamon Wind, and its captain boards the swan ship with an escort to inspect the holds. The captain relays stories of the audacious raiding by the Ironborn, including efforts in and around the waters of Old Town. The captain conveys the fact that while Old Town is well garrisoned by its wealth of soldiers, it has no such defence at sea, a fact which leads Huntress's captain to claim angrily that the best we can do is guard the sound and wait for the bitch queen in King's Landing to let Lord Paxter off his leash. What the captain doesn't know yet is that even as he speaks, the Redwine fleet is making its way south, Loras Tyrell having achieved the fall of Dragonstone that Cersei had required in order to release them. But at the same time, 
The bitch queen has stumbled into a trap of her own making and been imprisoned. His own liege lord, Mace Tyrell, controls King's Landing as Tommen's hand, and the Iron Throne's response to the Ironborn raiding the coast and riverways of the Reach is about to begin in earnest. With so much obvious danger in the air, Sam begins to contemplate where to hide Gilly and the baby for safety while he himself attends to his studies in Old Town. With Hornhill, Old Town and the Summer Isles all considered risky, Sam faces the sort of dilemmas George loves to throw at his characters. He knows it will have to be Horn Hill, which will mean confronting his family. For now, he leaves the pair behind and disembarks onto the cobbled streets of Old Town, which we first saw in the A Feast for Crows prologue. This Sam chapter is the final chapter of Feast, and so the two chapters bookend the volume, the former existing to inform us of the setting and set up several of the characters will soon be introduced to in the latter. And to set the mood as he finally arrives at the Citadel, we get a description the first time we see the place on page. The gates of the citadel were flanked by a pair of towering green sphinxes with the bodies of lions, the wings of eagles, and the tails of serpents. One had a man's face, one a woman's. Just beyond stood Scribe's Hearth, where old towners came in search of acolytes to write their wills and read their letters. Half a dozen bored scribes sat in open stalls, waiting for some custom. At other stalls, books were being bought and sold. Sam stopped at one that offered maps and looked over a hand-drawn map of the citadel to ascertain the shortest way to the Seneschal's court. Looming large within Sam's internal monologue, all the while, is his father. Sam wonders what would be worse, to run into a friend of his father's or an enemy, and contemplates what would have happened if he'd run away to the citadel before being chased off to the wall. If I had run off and taken a false name, I could have disappeared amongst the other novices. Father could have pretended that Dickon was his only son. I doubt he would even have troubled to search for me unless I took a mule to ride. Then he would have hunted me down, but only for the mule. So proximity has reawakened memories of abuse suffered at the hands of his father, It adds to the anxiety of being in a new place, and altogether, Sam is a young man caught between his past and his future, and in this sense is approaching the crossroads of maturity. When an acolyte with a pinched face named Lorcus greets Samwell with, You smell of novice, we're reminded of the mountain Sam must climb in order to reach his character goal as not only a man unafraid of his father, but one who's suitably qualified in his field and thus independent in that sense too. Any readers who went to university to better themselves will no doubt soon be heavily invested in this story if they weren't already, especially any who might have had high expectations placed upon them or overbearing parents. And so, following his time at the Watch, then his long voyage from East Watch to Old Town, Sam is now embarking on a new part of his journey, and the initial chilliness of the welcome at the Citadel adds tension, as we wonder how difficult George is going to make life for Sam at the Citadel. Even as an envoy from the Night's Watch, he is expected to slip Lorcas a penny or else wait indefinitely, according to acolyte Alaris the Sphinx, who turns up at his side. With Sam in a barely familiar environment, the introduction of Alaris is just one way this chapter links us as readers to the Pate prologue, where some of the groundwork for Citadel life has already been established. As we mentioned, the Citadel and its denizens bookend a feast for crows. And another intersection, of course, is Maester Eamon. Before long, Sam is unloading the meandering story of his journey to Alaris, to whom Aemon Targaryen is well known by reputation. From Jon Snow, Stannis, Melisandre, Gilly, and King's Blood, to Coldhands, Darion, Cinnamon Wind, and Aemon himself, Sam tells his story while Alaris listens intently, 
But it's when Sam mentions Daenerys and her dragons that the Sphinx really takes heed. Sam concludes his tale with, Daenerys is the only hope. Aemon said the Citadel must send her a maester at once to bring her home to Westeros before it's too late. And so, from beyond the grave, Aemon is still influencing Sam's arc, this time accelerating his mission to speak to an archmaester and ensuring that there is a sense of drama quickly injected into this Citadel storyline. Lorcus's greeting was a faint. There will be nothing dull or tedious about this plotline. And so, accompanied by Alaris, whom we now suspect to be Sorella Sand playing her game at the Citadel in disguise, Sam makes his way to the Isle of Ravens to see an Archmaester. We learn that the Ravenry, not too far away, is the oldest building in the Citadel, with its own drawbridge over the Honeywine, and the creeping ivy and general atmosphere bring to mind ancient universities like Oxford and Cambridge. Alaris reveals that it is not Archmaester Walgrave whom Sam is being taken to see, and this fact creates curiosity in the minds of readers, who know Walgrave to be in charge of the ravens, but also to be veering into dementia. On a landing outside of a door that seems to be their destination, the pair come across Leo Tyrell. We met Leo in the Pates prologue, but Sam has known him since childhood. Given that most of Sam's childhood memories seem to involve fear and humiliation, it's no wonder that it says the sight of Leo made Sam feel, quote, as if he were a boy of seven about to wet his small clothes. Nonetheless, he reveals his identity to the youth, even though Leo the bully had been unable to resist insulting Sam, calling him a black-clad whale. In our episode on the Pate prologue, we wondered if Leo lurking on this landing outside of this particular door might be a clue that he's some sort of spy. And as Sam identifies himself, inexplicably telling Leo his hated nickname, Sam the Slayer, the door opens and Sam and Aleras are invited inside. Leo is pointedly left in the passage, and we finally meet the mystery Archmaester, now revealed to be none other than Marwyn the Mage. Marwyn is a character with some reputation. He's first mentioned in A Game of Thrones by Miri Mazdur, being the one who taught her the common tongue in, of all places, a shy. We know from a Jamie chapter in A Storm of Swords that Marwyn was interested in Kyburn's strange ideas about death in contrast to the other maesters who are portrayed as more orthodox. And in the A Feast for Crows prologue, we hear this about him. Pate could not deny that Marwyn looked more a mastiff than a maester, as if he wants to bite you. The mage was not like other maesters. People said that he kept company with whores and hedge wizards, talked with hairy Ibanese and pitch-black summer islanders in their own tongues, and sacrificed to queer gods at the little sailors' temples down by the wharves. Men spoke of seeing him down in the undercity, in rat pits and black brothels, consorting with mummers, singers, sellswords, even beggars. Some even whispered that once he had killed a man with his fists. So George has been weaving in this mystique around Marwyn since very early on. A traveller, a magician, a deviant. The one archmaester unafraid to contemplate unconventional thinking. And now we finally get to meet him on page. Marwyn wore a chain of many metals around his bull's neck. Save for that, he looked more like a dockside thug than a maester. His head was too big for his body, and the way it thrust forward from his shoulders. And the description goes on in this vein, but by now we get the picture. Marwyn is a character who, despite being tertiary, is designed to stand out and stick in our memory. And so we should not underestimate the role he might go on to play as both a source of intrigue and someone who is bold and outspoken enough to affect the plot directly. And 
Another huge layer of intrigue is added to the scene almost immediately as, within the confines of the unkept room, we witness the unceasingly bright light of a glass candle, alive with its magical light. It says, The candle was unpleasantly bright. There was something queer about it. The flame did not flicker even when Archmaester Marwyn closed the door so hard that papers blew off a nearby table. The light did something strange to colours too. Whites were bright as fresh fallen snow, yellow shone like gold, reds turned to flame. But the shadows were so black they looked like holes in the world. Glass candles are Valyrian artifacts made of obsidian whose flames have not been seen for generations due to an inability to light them. But one burns in this chamber now, and Marwit says to Sam, All Valyrian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. The sorcerers of the Freehold could see across mountains, seas, and deserts with one of these glass candles. They could enter a man's dreams and give him visions— and speak to one another, half a world apart, seated before their candles. Do you think that might be useful, Slayer? And so finally, in this current age of ascending magic and others and dragons, a glass candle has been lit by Marwyn. As Leo Tyrell says in the prologue, probably repeating something he'd heard Marwyn say, Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. Marwin as a character is designed to remind us of the profound, the wondrous, and the terrifying future Westeros will soon endure. After the commentary of the post-war loss and decay woven into A Feast for Crows, Marwyn conveys to us at the end of the book that there are greater threats yet in store for our beloved cast of characters. The glass candle burning in its unnatural manner speaks to our imagination, and so Marwyn is the conduit for this. And our magical maester is soon pressing Sam to repeat what he told Alaris, the Sphinx. Calling him Slayer reveals that he had heard the conversation with Leo Tyrell on the landing, but he also adds, I know much of it and more, but some small parts may have escaped my notice. Which is our first real hint at how effective at revealing events from distant places glass candles might be. Marwyn questioned Sam closely in regards to the information relayed by Maester Aemon and the opinion that Daenerys is the princess that was promised. Whether or not this is really true, and don't forget that none of the characters in story are yet aware of R plus L equals J, which would make John a great fit as the prince that was literally promised, though that's a discussion for another time, what's important now is that a small wave of characters in-universe are beginning to believe Daenerys is the chosen one, and that wave is set to increase in size and strength in the Winds of Winter. Marwyn first scoffs at the prophecy, stating famously that prophecy will bite your cock off every time, although he listens to Sam relay Aemon's request that Daenerys has immediate need of a maester. Danny, of course, is rightly rumoured to be in possession of three young dragons, and Marwyn asserts that it was the Citadel who killed off the dragons in the first place, having no room for magic or the supernatural in their world. As such, Marwyn sees himself as the only appropriate maester to aid Daenerys, and without hesitation, shares his plan to go to her on Cinnamon Wind's return journey to Essos. And Marwyn orders Sam, stay and forge your chain. If I were you, I would do it quickly. A time will come when you'll be needed on the wall. And then tells Alaris to look after Sam before stomping off down the corridor towards the docks in order to arrive at Daenerys' side as soon as is humanly possible. 
We also learn that Marwin knew Sam was coming to the Citadel all along due to a very precise reading of this glass candle and sent Alaris to find him. Boom! This brief yet strong and exciting appearance from Marwin highlights the fact that here's a minor character who we're going to keep our eyes out for in wins. And we'll be talking about some possibilities for his role in the future plot a little bit later on. And finally, as the quick action of the scene subsides, a pasty youth who's been in the chamber all along offers to find Sam a room. This character, who instinctively gives Samwell the creeps, introduces himself as Pate, like the pig boy, ostensibly the novice we saw die in the feast prologue. Beside the fact we saw him die on page, there's a large clue that he's an imposter when he introduces himself as Pate like the pig boy, a comparison we know real Pate hated and was so often used as a pejorative against him. Real Pate would be very unlikely to offer this as an introduction. And the mystery of who Pate most likely is is probably an open and shut case, given that the mysterious alchemist was so closely involved in his prologue. And see our A Feast for Crows prologue episode for more information on why so many of us believe that the alchemist is none other than Jack and Hagar. The deeper mystery here might be just why the faceless men would be infiltrating the Citadel in the first place. We'll discuss that later, but for now, we'll end this section by contemplating this quick intersection at the end of the book. Possible spy, lazy Leo Tyrell, Marwyn, possible future maester for Daenerys, the Sand Snake Sorella masquerading as Alaris the Acolyte, a faceless man masquerading as Pate, and at the heart of it all, Sam, the other slayer from the wall. This was an important end to the chapter, one that sets up fascinating plot lines and dynamics for The Winds of Winter without neglecting Sam's growth arc as an important POV character. In that final scene, we see these interactions that are highly reminiscent of the assembling the team trope that anyone who's ever read classic fantasy, watched an Avengers movie, or played D&D is well familiar with. Will Sam the Slayer, Pate the Pig Boy, and Alaris the Sphinx, all pseudo-protégés of Marwin the Mage, with the possible unlikely addition of Lazy Leo, find themselves facing danger and adventure together in the Winds of Winter. And with Sam as our point of view on this action, we can wonder if, when Leo described the advent of an age of wonder and terror, an age for gods and heroes, the groundwork has now been laid to set up Samuel Tarley as one of those heroes, albeit an unlikely one. But before we look ahead to what this group might be up to in the Winds of Winter, We're going to turn our attention to the group we expect to be the antagonists in their story. The Ironborn are prowling the coasts of the Reach, and the reader has good reason to suppose the Reavers are led by their newly elected king, Euron Greyjoy. Yeah, last seen in Victarion Greyjoy's The Reaver chapter, Euron has recently sent his younger brother Victarion to Slaver's Bay to find Daenerys Targaryen and her dragons. Without Victarion to be a POV on the new Ironborn King, it might have seemed like our view of this upcoming action would be quite one-sided. But Euron has another brother, and so in our next segment, we'll review what happened to the damp hair, Aaron Greyjoy, in A Feast for Crows, and everything we learned about him and Euron from the darkest and most chilling of all the Winds of Winter preview chapters. Stay tuned and buckle up, we're about to dive into The Forsaken. The sea was stirring. The waves grew larger as the wind rose, sending plumes of spray to crash against the longships. The drowned god wakes, thought Aaron. He could hear his voice welling from the depths of the sea. 
I shall be with you here this day, my strong and faithful servant, the voice said. No godless man will sit my sea stone chair. In A Feast for Crows, we witnessed Aaron Greyjoy conceive the revival of the ancient tradition of the king's moot on the Iron Islands and bring it to fruition. At the king's moot, men such as Gilbert Farwind, Eric Ironmaker and Dunstan Drum put themselves forward in the ancient tradition of the Ironborn that had lain dormant for centuries. And then Aaron announced... Nine sons were born from the loins of Quellon Greyjoy. One was mightier than all the rest and knew no fear, and as he had hoped, his brother Victarion stood before the crowd of assembled captains and lords, shipwrights and sailors, warriors and thralls, and made his claim. But no sooner had the captains heard Victarion's speech and welcomed his gifts of silver and gold and begun chanting his name, than Asha Greyjoy stood forth, and made her own claim, offering something quite different, an end to thankless wars, new lands to settle in the north, and a promise to make friends rather than enemies on the mainland. And so the supporters of uncle and niece fell into arguing, and it seems that the damp hair despaired at that moment, for it says, it seemed as though some savage storm was about to engulf them all, The storm god is amongst us, the priest thought, sowing fury and discord. Then, of course, came the moment Aaron had been dreading, for, as he had feared, his eldest brother had been biding his time. When Asha made her speech against Victarion, she stated, The crow's eye is his elder and has a better claim. And Huron now chose this moment of chaos to make that claim. The shouting of the captains was silenced by the sound of a horn being blown by one of Euron's followers, quote, a monstrous man with a shaved head. Rings of gold and jade and jet glistened on his arms, and on his broad chest was tattooed some bird of prey, talons dripping blood. And the horn itself was described thus. Shiny, black and twisted, and taller than a man, as he held it with both hands. It was bound about with bands of red gold and dark steel, incised with ancient Valyrian glyphs that seemed to glow redly as the sound swelled. And the noise it made, which Dampere thinks of as a wail of pain and fury and the horn of hell, not only brought silence to the assembly, but led Aaron Greyjoy to pray to his drowned god to, quote, raise a mighty wave and smash the horn to silence. And then Euron spoke to the moot, making his own case. Iron men, you have heard my horn. Now hear my words. I am Balon's brother, Quellon's eldest living son. Lord Vicon's blood is in my veins and the blood of the old Kraken. Yet I have sailed farther than any of them. Only one living Kraken has never known defeat. Only one has never bent his knee. Only one has sailed to a shy by the shadow and seen wonders and terrors beyond imagining. My little brother would finish Balon's war and claim the north. My sweet niece would give us peace and pine cones. Asher prefers victory to defeat. Victarion wants a kingdom not a few scant yards of earth. From me, you shall have both. Crow's eye, you call me. Well, who has a keener eye than a crow? After every battle, the crows come in their hundreds and their thousands to feast upon the fallen. A crow can espy death from afar 
and I say that all of Westeros is dying. Those who follow me will feast until the end of their days. We are the Ironborn and once we were conquerors. Our writ ran everywhere the sound of the waves was heard. My brother would have you be content with the cold and dismal north, my niece with even less. But I shall give you Lannisport, Highgarden, the Arbor, Old Town, the Riverlands and the Reach, the Kingswood and the Rainwood, Dawn and the Marches, the Mountains of the Moon and the Vale of Arryn, Tarth and the Stepstones. I say we take it all. We take Westeros. All for the greater glory of our drowned god, to be sure. It says then that, quote, for half a heartbeat, even Aaron was swept away by the boldness of his words. The priest had dreamed the same dream when first he'd seen the red comet in the sky. We shall sweep over the green lands with fire and sword and root out the seven gods of the Septons and the white trees of the Northmen. But Asher is quick to ask Euron how he plans to hold the Seven Kingdoms when the Ironborn can't even hold the sparsely populated and virtually undefended North. Euron speaks of history and of Aegon the Conqueror then, and Asher and Victarion both express their disbelief. Aegon the Conqueror had dragons, which Euron does not, and that's when Euron tells the assembly this about the horn they had just heard. The horn you heard I found amongst the smoking ruins that were Valyria, where no man has dared to walk but me. You heard its call and felt its power. It is a dragon horn, bound with bands of red gold and Valyrian steel graven with enchantments. The dragon lords of old sounded such horns before the doom devoured them. With this horn, Iron Men, I can bind dragons to my will. That's all well and good, sneers Asha, but... She points out there are no more dragons, which obviously plays right into her uncle's hands as his reply, there are three and I know where to find them. Surely that's worth a driftwood crown. Along with a few chests of gold offerings is all that was needed to gain him a roar of acclaim from the moot. And as the crowd roared their support for his elder brother, it says, Even a priest may doubt, even a prophet may know terror. Aaron Damper reached within himself for his god and discovered only silence. As a thousand voices shouted out his brother's name, all he could hear was the scream of a rusted iron hinge. The rusted hinge is a reference that's repeated numerous times in Aaron's point of view with increasingly disquieting implications, and we'll discuss this again shortly when we finally discover the meaning of this haunting memory in Aaron's chilling Winds of Winter sample chapter. And that thought, as his eldest brother received the acclaim of the moot, a body he himself had conceived and called to be assembled, is the last we hear of Aaron Greyjoy for some time. In A Dance with Dragons, we learn from Asha Greyjoy that no one has heard from her uncle Aaron since the king's moot on Old Wick. Although we ought to have been suspicious, given the fate of characters such as Sewain Botley and Baylor Blacktide, both executed for their descent over Euron's claiming of the sea stone chair, readers were, in the most part, satisfied with the explanation seemingly accepted by Victarion that Aaron had retreated to Great Wick to sulk and brood to preach and plan a takedown of his villainous elder brother. Triss Botley, however, suspected foul play and wondered if Euron had slit Dampere's throat. 
But the truth of Aaron's disappearance turns out to be a lot darker than a mere throat slash. We now know that Euron has subjected Aaron to a fate worse than death. As we'll see, there turns out to be a tremendous parallel between Aaron Greyjoy's arc and that of his nephew Theon. In A Clash of Kings, we see Theon experience what he expected to be a moment of triumph as Reek returned with what Theon expected to be fighting men who would help him defeat the Northmen under Sir Roderick Cassell, who had him besieged at Winterfell. Finally, Theon thought, his fortunes would turn and he would defeat these enemies of his. But that moment swiftly became the most bitter defeat once Ramsay Snow entered Winterfell and turned on Theon and his remaining Ironborn. Yeah, because then Theon falls off the page for a long time and we next see him in A Dance with Dragons when he's introduced to us as Reek, held in a dungeon at the Dreadfort and subject to vile treatment and torture. Similarly, after what he thought would be a moment of triumph at the King's Moot, Damp hair falls off the page for quite a while, only mentioned in passing in A Dance with Dragons, and like Theon, no one seems to know exactly what happened to him. When he returns to the page, like his nephew, he's in a dungeon and is being subjected to torment and some of the worst treatment imaginable. At the Reno Worldcon in 2011, George offered to read aloud Aaron One from The Winds of Winter, entitled The Forsaken. He promised much grimness and, quote, seriously twisted stuff from the chapter, but the crowd, presumably in a lighter mood, voted for the Arian II chapter to be read instead. Curiosity over what exactly was contained in The Forsaken grew and grew, with fans left to wonder about the missed opportunity to explore the darkest corners of George's imagination. But in 2016, George dusted off the manuscript to read in front of a packed room of eager fans at the Balticon convention. We were in attendance there, which was a great time, and shout out to the many friends we met at Balticon, all of whom gathered with us to listen to George's reading. And George wasn't joking when he offered a chapter of seriously twisted stuff. The Forsaken is undoubtedly one of the darkest and most disturbing chapters in the A Song of Ice and Fire catalogue. A voyage into torture, torment and degradation. A wicked hallucinogenic trip over the open ocean. And throughout its opening passages, we're reminded of that first Reek chapter as Aaron sits shackled in the blackness of a dungeon, his feet bloated, his beard crawling with lice, and his skin gnawed upon by starving rats. As a saltwater tide sweeps in over his painful wounds, he lies awake, disoriented and confused, and we soon learn that the man inflicting this unthinkable horror upon him is none other than his own brother. Euron Greyjoy. We also learn that, not content to have bound the damp hair in such a blackness that the light of a simple lantern hurts the man's eyes, Euron is also forcing him to drink the hallucinogenic concoction known as Shade of the Evening, the same curious substance Daenerys consumed at the House of the Undying in Carth that caused an intense series of prophetic visions. We saw Euron drinking it in Victarion's final A Feast for Crows chapter and it seems that he consumes enough of the stuff that, like the warlocks of Carth, his lips have taken on a blue tint. While forcing the shade down Aaron's throat, Euron promises truth and we're left to consider the limitless hell the priest is trapped in, suffering dehumanising torture within a terrifying and mind-bending psychoactive trip. And we'll analyse some of the visions he experiences later in the episode in the hope of perceiving a small piece of the future, but what we can say for now is that they're a blend of prophetic visions and memories personal to Aaron. In his drugged sleep, he hears that rusted hinge that seems to haunt him and sees his long-dead brother, Yuri. As he talks to Yuri, he turns into Euron and it says that his smiling eye was hidden and, quote, 
He showed the world his blood eye now, dark and terrible. This reference strikes us as curious, and we wonder if it's something meant to be quite literal, in spite of Aaron's fevered, hallucinating state. The reason for Euron's eye patch is never mentioned, though in Theon's The Winds of Winter sample chapter, he seems quite terrified of what he thinks of as a black eye shining with malice behind an eye patch. Since his smiling eye is noted to be blue, it's possible that Euron has heterochromia or two different coloured eyes. And this condition can, among other things, be either congenital or the result of an injury that causes subconjunctival haemorrhage, a.k.a. a blood eye. It strikes us that this is the sort of thing that might be further explained later to be somehow connected with the childhood trauma that Aaron so clearly associates with his brother. And even if the cause is something quite mundane, Euron has certainly leveraged his imperfection into an intimidating and unique characteristic. In his first hallucination, Euron speaks of the bleeding star, which Aaron had once thought presaged ironborn victory, and makes apocalyptic threats and promises, blowing horns and commanding dragons and krakens, and declaring that he is now Aaron's god, and that his goal is nothing less than the Iron Throne. And then, on that seat's spikes, Aaron sees impaled, quote, The maiden, and the father, and the mother, the warrior, and crone, and smith, even the stranger, they hung side by side with all manner of queer foreign gods, the great shepherd and the black goat, three-headed trios and the pale child Bacalon, the lord of light, and the butterfly god of Nath. And, to Aaron's dismay, it also says, And there, swollen and green, half-devoured by crabs, the drowned god festered with the rest, seawater still dripping from his hair. The trippy scene highlights the stark contrast between the brothers. Aaron is religious to a fault, a zealot of the drowned god, who exhibits total faith, perhaps even blind faith. Euron, on the other hand, is nihilistic to the extent he feels unrestrained and guiltless and free to commit whatever atrocities he feels like at the time, beyond the concept of sin and the reach of any god. In fact, the chapter frames Euron as a man intent on ascending towards apotheosis, ready to sacrifice people and gods alike, in the belief he himself can become some sort of living demigod. How literal this all is remains to be seen. As Aaron wakes in terror with piss streaming down his leg, we realise that there is no respite from the torture, not even in dreams. Euron is making sure of that. Now awake, Aaron provides us with some of the backstory we knew and some that we didn't, as he reminisces on his regrets regarding the king's moot. He, after all, was the one who had called the moot, his piousness leading him to champion the cause of the old way. How that plan backfired. He thinks back on how he had urged Victarion to oppose their brother after the moot, but had been refused and had decided the ultimate responsibility lay with him. The king's moot had chosen Euron Crozai, but the king's moot was made of men, and men were weak and foolish things, too easily swayed by golden lies. I summoned them to Naga's bones in the great king's hall. I called them all together to choose a righteous king, but in their drunken folly they have sinned. It was for him to undo what they had done. And so Damp Hair set out to preach against Euron to the common folk, hoping to gain popular support against his godless brother. But it turns out that Aaron bears the responsibility, not just of Euron's ascension as king, but of his own current confinement in the hold of the silence, since we learn that on the day the mutes took him, he had discarded his entourage of drowned men in order to be alone with and closer to his god, thus giving himself no chance of escape. Yeah, it says, Dampere took to the sea following the king's moot, seeking the guidance of his god. And it says, 
Quote, there and then the drowned god had come to him once more, his voice welling up from the depths of the sea, telling him, Aaron, my good and faithful servant, you must tell the ironborn that the crow's eye is no true king, that the sea stone chair by rights belong to... What the drowned god may have said to him isn't revealed precisely as Aaron's train of thought goes on to consider both Victarion and Asher, coming to the conclusion that neither alone could stand against Euron, but that perhaps he should encourage them to join together as husband and wife, king and queen, to lead the Ironborn back to the old ways. While his thought reveals just how little he actually knows his niece Asha, his favourite of all of Balon's children, it falls short of revealing what, if anything, the drowned god actually told him there in the sea about who the sea stone chair belonged to by right. And it was after this experience, when Aaron was full of fierce resolve, that he recalls his brother Euron's henchmen attacking him then and there upon the strand of Old Wick, as the captain's longboat still lay upon the sand. The next thing he remembered, it says... He was fettered and feverish in the bowels of Euron's ship, Silence. And his god is all Aaron has for company, in spite of being moved from captivity aboard the ship to a dungeon somewhere. It was there that one folly of flowers arrived to sustain him with porridge and honey. Folly of Flowers is a character that was first introduced to us in Victarion's The Reaver chapter in A Feast for Crows, she being the bastard daughter of Lord Humphrey Hewitt of Oakenshield in the Shield Islands, whom Euron had taken as a lover. And so we can surmise, and in fact, Falia herself confirms that this dungeon was on Oakenshield following the sea battles that occurred off the Shield Islands some three months after the King's Moot, giving us a point along the timeline that we can measure the length of Aaron's imprisonment by. But Falia's visit to the dungeon obviously takes place sometime after the events of the Reaver, since she tells Aaron that she can carry no message to Victarion, as he requests, since Victarion has departed, bound for Essos to bring Daenerys Targaryen back to be Euron's rock wife. In practical terms, Victarion was Aaron's last chance at being rescued, and so the priest seeks further salvation in his faith. Falia Flowers, in her Greenland finery, was a welcome sight for the stimulation-deprived Aeron, and she also tells him of her ambition to become Euron's salt wife. She is putting a lot of stock in Euron's promises, and Aeron warns her, Run, he will hurt you, he will kill you, even before realising she is with child. Later that night, as the tide enters his cell once more, Aaron prayed to his drowned god for death. I have been your true and leal servant, he says, twisting in his chains. Can we imagine what it must be like to be Aaron Greyjoy, sustaining his faith in the most unfavourable and bleak of situations, while Euron the anti-god thrives without consequence? Faith is all Aaron has, and it turns out his god is not coming, only Euron's mute servants, to deliver him once more to the bowels of silence. And soon we understand Aaron's faith, character, and motives a whole lot better. Euron visits his brother below decks and asserts that your god has forsaken you, and then adds, It was me who taught you to pray, little brother. Have you forgotten? I would visit your bedchamber at night when I had too much to drink. So paired with a later comment from a crew member, we realise that Euron not only has a history of sexually abusing Aaron, but that he's also proud of it. Suddenly the rusty hinges make sense, Aaron's history of drunkenness and later his obsessive piousness make sense, suddenly Aaron Greyjoy himself makes sense. And in fact, after the chapter reading in Baltimore, George confirmed that Aaron became so devout as a means of hiding from internal pain caused by his brother. 
we are drawn ever more to sympathise with a character who had initially been difficult to relate to. And the plot thickens further when, after Aaron defiantly declares that no man is as accursed as the Kinslayer, and that even Euron wouldn't dare to murder his own brother, Euron confesses to murdering their two half-brothers. Do you remember little Robin, wretched creature? Do you remember that big head of his, how soft it was? All he could do was mule and shit. He was my second. Harlan was my first. All I had to do was pinch his nose shut. The grayscale had turned his mouth to stone, so he couldn't cry out, but his eyes grew frantic as he died. They begged me. When the life went out of them, I went out and pissed into the sea, waiting for the god to strike me down. With a further confession that Euron was responsible for the death of Balon, albeit indirectly, most probably by the way of a faceless man first alluded to by the ghost of High Heart, it's made quite plain that Euron respects no code of ethics whatsoever. Murder, kinslaying, child abuse mean nothing to him. Without the fear of consequence from a god, Euron deems these taboos to be within the realms of what is acceptable. Absolutely anything goes. Again, the contrast between these two brothers exemplifies the danger of too much God versus the danger of nihilistic immorality, and we can view them as opposing sides of a continuum. With no moral structure, the crow's eye will continue to run rampant and commit unspeakable acts. If you had been wondering how George could best Ramsay Snow as a wicked villain, then look no further. And aside from sadistically prolonging Aaron's suffering, a clue is offered as to why Euron is keeping him alive. A holy man with holy blood, says Euron. I may have need of that blood. Later. And of Aaron, it says, that night he prayed for his brother's death. Aaron recalls that in the second dungeon he was joined by other holy men, an alarming trend in light of what Euron said about holy blood on board silence. There were six, it says. Three wore the robes of septons of the Greenlands, and one the red raiment of a priest of R'hllor. The last was hardly recognisable as a man. Both his hands had been burned down to the bone, and his face was a charred and blackened horror, where two blind eyes moved sightlessly above the cracked cheeks dripping pus. He was dead within hours of being shackled to the wall, but the mutes left his body there to ripen for three days afterwards. Last were two warlocks of the east, with flesh as white as mushrooms, and lips the purplish blue of a bad bruise, all so gaunt and starved that only skin and bones remained. One had lost his legs. The mutes hung him from a rafter. Pre, he cried as he swung back and forth. Pre, pre. And so, if you ever wondered about what happened to Pyat Pri after he sent that sorrowful man to assassinate Danny following the events at the House of the Undying, now we have the end of the story, though some of the middle is still missing. In A Dance with Dragons, Zaro Zoondaxos told Danny that, seeking revenge, Pri and three of his fellow warlocks had set out to find her in Pentos not long after her departure from Karth. Later in A Feast for Crows, Euron Greyjoy would tell Victarion of capturing a Gallius out of Karth with four warlocks aboard. In the World of Ice and Fire app, it says that this is where Euron found the Great Horn Dragonbinder, which makes a lot of sense considering the goal of the warlocks was vengeance and that they had expressed an outsized interest in the dragons in the first place. And so a couple of conclusions we can reach are that the two warlocks Aaron shares a dungeon with are the survivors of these four who first introduced Euron to the Shade of the Evening. We can also join a number of people in story, including Roderick the Reader, who doubted Euron's claim that he visited the ruins of Old Valyria. 
if the horn was stolen from the Carthian warlocks, it goes to follow that his other claims about Valyria, including one we'll discuss shortly, could be lies. But if his possession of the Carthian warlocks and their horn reveals him as a liar, in this dungeon Euron also reveals his hand as a political player, confessing that he knows the Shield Islands will be retaken, and that the Ironborn to whom he gave those seats as gifts will be diminished when they are. Sir Harris Harlaw, the reader's heir and one of Asha's champions at the King's Moot, Andric the Unsmiling, the champion of Dunstan Drum, Maron Volmark, a supporter of Victarions and a descendant of Black Harren Hoare, who had been noted for his own possible claim to the Seastone Chair, and Newt the Barber, a longtime member of Victarion's crew, are all men who could oppose Euron in future, as Victarion himself had realized in The Reaver. There's a shrewd confidence about Euron, and we begin to wonder about his wider picture in the political game, as well as his abilities as a sorcerer. He's also clearly continuing to be successful as a reaver and raider, telling Aaron, Our longships are raiding up the Manda and all along the coast, even to the Arbor and the Red Wine Straits. The old way, brother. This is another revelation in a chapter that spans many trackless days and weeks that allows us to pin it to a timeline. Sam Tarley sees the aftermath and hears about these raids and the Ironborn quartering themselves on the Isle of Pigs, a small island off the arbor, in late May as he arrives in Old Town. And this second dungeon is soon revealed to be on that Isle of Pigs. And here Aaron undergoes another forced dose of Shade of the Evening and sees the long ships of the Ironborn adrift and burning on a boiling blood-red sea. And Euron sat on the Iron Throne beside a shadow in woman's form, long and tall and terrible, her hands alive with pale white fire. While we will get into some analysis later, these visions certainly add depth, mystery and colour to balance against the continuous bleakness of the chapter. When the day finally arrives for Aaron to be unshackled and moved from this dungeon, amidst shafts of warm, golden sunlight that bathe and soothe him as he longs for the sea, he's so weak that the crew members have to hold him up. When he's brought into a hall, one of Euron's men informs him that the Redwine fleet has rounded the Arm of Dorne and is drawing near, while Hightower ships are making their way down the Whispering Sound, aiming to crush the Ironborn in a pincer move. Battle is imminent, but the Ironborn seem infused with confidence. Once again, we can look to other chapters from other POVs to place this on the timeline. Kevin Lannister thinks that Paxter is sailing around Dawn in his A Dance with Dragons epilogue chapter, and in the first Ariane sample chapter, she knows that Redwine's fleet has passed the Stepstones, allowing us to sync this chapter very closely to the events of the second Ariane chapter. Where all of this timeline analysis leads is the conclusion that the upcoming sea battle will be occurring almost simultaneously with the Battle of Storm outside Storm's End, the Battle of Ice in the north, and the Battle of Fire in Marine, in which case we truly cannot doubt that the Winds of Winter is set to open with a very large bang. And so Aaron is taken out aboard Silence once more. He sees many familiar banners of the Ironborn flying from a fleet of three dozen longships, and above them he sees an unfamiliar banner, a flag showing a red eye with a black pupil beneath an iron crown supported by two crows. This is the banner Sam Tarley saw on a wrecked longship on his approach to Old Town, the banner of King Euron Greyjoy, though neither he nor Aaron knew it as such. Once aboard Silence, he lays eyes upon his brother. It says, Euron Crozai stood upon the deck of Silence, clad in a suit of black scale armour like nothing Aaron had ever seen before. 
dark as smoke it was, but Euron wore it as easily as if it was the thinnest silk. The scales were edged in red gold and gleamed and shimmered when they moved. Patterns could be seen within the metal, walls and glyphs and arcane symbols folded into the steel. Valyrian steel, the damp hair knew. His armour is Valyrian steel. In all the seven kingdoms, no man owned a suit of Valyrian steel. Such things had been known 400 years ago, in the days before the doom, but even then they would have cost a kingdom. Euron did not lie. He has been to Valyria. No wonder he was mad. Now, George is really trying to sell Euron as the complete villain, not only devoid of all principle and conscience, but also the only man in the Seven Kingdoms with a suit of Valyrian steel armor. Now Aaron truly believes that Euron has been to Valyria. He's finally buying into that mystique, although, as we said, some in-story and some readers still rightfully maintain their doubts. But at least we can all agree that he now looks as formidable as he is evil. And the chapter closes with that collection of holy priests from diverse backgrounds being bound to the prows of the ships in place of or sharing space with the ship's figureheads. Euron, of course, has saved Aeron for his own ship. And at the end of the chapter, Euron brings his brother some company next to him on the prow, in the form of Falia flowers. Now missing her tongue, and visibly with child, we're made to feel sympathy for this girl who, in Victorian's The Reaver chapter, elicited only our disgust when she used her favour with Euron to have her half-sisters and her father's wife stripped naked and forced to serve the conquering Ironborn in her father's hall. Aaron has warned the reader about his brother's poisoned prizes, and those now include the promises made to Falia. We are left to wonder if Euron will bleed the priests into the water, perhaps as some ungodly magic ritual to achieve his victory, and thus realise this prophecy from Makoro's flame reading in A Dance with Dragons. A tall and twisted thing, with one black eye and ten long arms, sailing on a sea of blood. Overall, The Forsaken has captured the dark imaginations of many fans, and it once sets up Aeron as a sympathetic character whom we want to survive, and Euron as an unscrupulous deviant, bereft of decency or conscience, who deserves to die. Leaving Aeron so vulnerable and Euron so dangerous at the tail end of this chapter is why many fans are excited to see what comes next for the Greyjoy brothers. Does Aeron's faith have limits? Does Euron's evil have limits? We all look forward to finding out. There's a range of possibilities that exist for Euron's future in the narrative, from a more mundane, uber-bad-guy scenario that more or less lines up with the HBO show, to the eldritch apocalypse theory espoused by our friend Poor Quentin over at Nauticast. In the second half of the episode, we'll touch on these things and more, when we return with our speculation about the next events we expect to see on page from both Aaron and Samwell's point of views as we dig into the sea battle in the Reach. But first, let's take a break to recognize our patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Radio Westeros is powered by patrons, and we owe our thanks to... Arrowdo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Hortense of Ashai, B-Word the Queen Beyond the Wall, Blight Spirit, Kaboth the Unfrozen, Christian, Chris B, Sir Archibald Cadogan, Marja the Mage, David, Dean, Dibbles and Bits, Drew, Eliana Targaryen, Sir Sorsadelica, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Juna of House Aiko, 
Casey, the Lady of the Frostfangs, Lady Silverwing, Infenderis, the Unspeakable Terror, Liam, Lady Steelwind, Sharon of Littlefield, Boss, the Sithorian, Sally, Sammy, Tristis Lorian, the Wild Child of the Wolfswood, Scotty, Tim, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. And then he saw her, a single-masted galley, lean and low with a dark red hull. Her sails, now furled, were black as a starless sky. Even at anchor, silence looked both cruel and fast. The Forsaken ends with what appears to be Euron Greyjoy's fleet preparing for a naval battle. The fleet was first mentioned in Cersei's seventh chapter of A Feast for Crows when news of the attack on the Shield Islands reached the small council in King's Landing. It is said to number a thousand ships, though most of the councillors doubt that number. Cersei specifically questions how a fleet of that size could have approached the islands unnoticed, given that ironborn longships are well known for using the coastline as their primary navigation tool. Marjorie mentions that her brother Garland is convinced that the fleet sailed far to the west in the Sunset Sea, out of sight of land, before swooping down on the shields. Well, Cersei thinks this is mere excuses. In The Reaver, Victarion thinks about the fleet's journey south. It was whispered about the fleet that Euron's wizards had much and more to do with that, that the crow's eye appeased the storm god with blood sacrifice. How else would he have dared sail so far to the west instead of following the shoreline, as was the custom? Since Euron's fleet clearly did exactly what Garland Tyrell suspected, we think the conclusion is that Euron has obtained a type of technology previously unknown to his seafaring people. We know that, in real life, the simple magnetic compass, along with objects like the cross staff, the sextant, the Viking's so-called sunstone, and the astrolabe, were either developed or were already in use somewhere during the medieval period. Having travelled so much further afield than any other ironborn, we can assume that Euron encountered many new ideas, at least some of which he could have adopted and proceeded to capitalise upon, setting himself apart from his rivals and revelling in the superstitious claims of sorcery that would be attributed to him. This small detail goes some way towards showing how extremely canny Euron is, something we'll be talking about a lot in this segment. For now, getting back to the assessment of his strength at sea, Orin Waters reminds Lord Orton Merriweather, who suspects that some fool has double-counted, half as many ships would still be 500, my lord. Only the arbor has enough strength at sea to oppose a fleet that size. And in that same Circe chapter, the Queen thinks this about Paxter Redwine's strength at sea. He owned 200 warships and five times as many merchant carracks, wine cogs, trading galleys, and whalers. Redwine was encamped beneath the walls of Dragonstone, however, and the greater part of his fleet was engaged in ferrying men across Blackwater Bay for the assault on that island stronghold. The remainder prowled Shipbreaker Bay to the south, where only their presence prevented Storm's End from being resupplied by sea. So, Lord Redwine has about 1,200 ships at his disposal, of which 200 are warships. Euron Greyjoy may have as many as 1,000, of which at least some are warships to be reckoned with, according to Orain Waters, who tells Cersei... The common longship is small compared to our galleys, that is true, but the ironmen have larger ships as well. Lord Balon's great kraken and the warships of the iron fleet were made for battle, not for raids. They are the equal of our lesser war galleys in speed and strength, and most are better crewed and captained. The ironmen live their whole lives at sea. 
So, much like the real-life Northmen known as Vikings who raided, conquered, and settled across the waters of Northern Europe and beyond during the early medieval period, the Ironborn are seasoned sailors and warriors whose experience and ferocity undoubtedly make them more than a one-to-one match with their Westerosi Greenlander foe. Whether they have 500 ships or 1,000, this is a dangerous fleet that is currently inflicting a world of damage on the lightly defended western shores of the Seven Kingdoms. Yes, for in spite of Roderick the Reader's warnings to Euron in the Riva about the red wine galleys that patrol the coasts in the southern reach, by Cersei 8 in A Feast for Crows, we learn... The news from the Reach seemed to grow more dire with every raven. The Iron Men had not been content with their new rocks, it seemed. They were raiding up the Manda in strength, and had gone so far as to attack the Arbor and the smaller islands that surrounded it. The Red Wines had kept no more than a dozen warships in their home waters, and all those had been overwhelmed, taken, or sunk. And now there were reports that this madman who called himself Euron Crozai was even sending longships up Whispering Sound toward Old Town. In Sam's point of view aboard Cinnamon Wind, as they approach Old Town, they encounter a scout ship who inspects them before allowing them to pass. The captain brings them news from port, including... A fortnight ago, some of those bloody bastards captured a Tairoshi merchantman in the straits. They killed her crew, donned their clothes, and used the dyes they found to color their whiskers half a hundred colors. Once inside the walls, they meant to set the port ablaze and open a gate from within whilst we fought the fire. Might have worked, but they ran afoul of the Lady of the Tower, and her oarsmaster has a Tairoshi wife. When he saw all the green and purple beards, he hailed them in the tongue of Tyrosh, and not one of them had the words to hail him back. So, more evidence with that trick that Euron is exceedingly clever, though as yet we don't know what his goals in Old Town are, and we'll talk about that more shortly. We saw his skills as a tactician in evidence in the taking of the shields when he sent a dozen longships raiding up the Manda to draw out the defenders of the shield isles, while he kept the bulk of his fleet well offshore. At that point, with the four islands only lightly defended, it was a simple thing for the Ironborn to sail in on the evening tide, with the sun at their backs so that they swept ashore nearly undetected. Also in the Reaver, as we mentioned in the previous segment, we saw Euron shrewdly allocating the Shield Islands to men who had supported his rivals, thus removing them from his fleet and leaving them to take the blame and suffer the defeat when the conquest failed, as he was sure it would. He also manages to leave the worst of the wounded behind as well, therefore taking only the most loyal and fit men for the journey further south. Although it appears that Euron initially planned for this whole fleet to sail to Slaver's Bay for Daenerys and her dragons, in the Reva we see him pivot after recognising the discontent of some of the captains and lords who want plunder, as the Ironborn always do. It was Roderick Harlaw who first questioned the wisdom of sailing east with such a huge fleet. Where would they find fresh water and food for such a force, which would no doubt be extremely unwelcome in the ports of Essos? How would such a fleet stay together during the autumn storms in the Narrow Sea? And though Roderick the Reader ventured into dangerous territory in expressing his doubts about Euron's claim to have sailed into Valyria and the Smoking Sea, Euron does at length admit to his brother Victarion that the Reader had a point. He says, It comes to me that the Reader was not wrong. Too large a fleet could never hold together over such a distance. The voyage is too long, too perilous. Only our finest ships and crews could hope to sail to Slaver's Bay and back. The Iron Fleet. 
And so Euron manages to dispense with yet another possibly troublesome element of his great navy, his own brother, whom he must know holds a significant grudge against him for a host of reasons, not the least of which was the recent defeat of Victarion's own candidacy at the King's Moot. And by promising his notably dutiful younger brother that the reward for the voyage will be nothing less than the sea stone chair after he himself takes the iron throne, Euron has, he hopes, neutralised that grudge and ensured that Victarion will do what is asked of him while he himself gets to remain in Westeros and take part in what comes next. And what, from Euron's point of view, will come next? In The Reaver, he tells Victarion, I had forgotten what a small and noisy folk they are, my ironborn. I would bring them dragons, and they shout for grapes. The rape and pillage of the Reach is not only what these ironborn desire, it is what they need to keep them occupied while they await Victarion's return, to bind them ever closer to Euron, who's brought them to this opportunity and to make Euron the object of their gratitude. As for what Euron needs, it's mentioned again and again that the Redwine fleet is the only one that could oppose him in all the Seven Kingdoms. Cersei's own attempt to forestall the naval dominance of the Reach by building a royal fleet has been decimated by Orain Water's defection to the Stepstones with that nascent fleet. By forcing Redwine to sail around Westeros to defend his own home territories, Euron has therefore ensured that King's Landing is left defenceless to a naval attack, and even, though perhaps unintentionally, made it easier for John Connington and Aegon to take Storm's End, since it appears that Pexter Redwine has recalled his entire fleet to face off against the Ironborn. Yeah, we can guess this is the case based on something Valina Tolland tells Ariane Martell at Ghost Hill in Ariane's first Winds of Winter sample chapter. A new pirate king has set up on Torturer's Deep, the Lord of the Waters, he styles himself. This one has real warships, three deckers, monstrous large. You were wise not to come by sea. Since the Redwine fleet passed through the Stepstones, those waters are crawling with strange sails, all the way north to the Straits of Tarth and Shipbreaker's Bay. Meermen, Volantines, Lycini, even reavers from the Iron Islands. Some have entered the Sea of Dorne to land men on the south shore of Cape Wrath. The reference to the Pirate King is almost certainly none other than Orain Waters, as we've discussed previously, but it's the reference to Shipbreaker Bay which is of interest here. Earlier, we noted that some of Paxter Redwine's ships were patrolling Shipbreaker Bay to prevent Storm's End being resupplied by sea during Mace's siege of Stannis's small garrison. But interestingly, following Redwine's passage through the Steppe Stones en route back to the Reach, Shipbreaker Bay seems to have been abandoned to pirates and strange sails, indicating that those Redwine ships have most likely rejoined the main fleet. In A Feast for Crows, the captain of Huntress, the patrol ship that stops Cinnamon Wind on its approach to Old Town, says this about these ironborn. These are no mere reavers. The ironmen have always raided where they could. They would strike sudden from the sea, carry off some gold and girls, and sail away. But there were seldom more than one or two longships, never more than half a dozen. Hundreds of their ships afflict us now, sailing out of the shield islands and some of the rocks around the arbor. They've taken Stone Crab Key, the Isle of Pigs, and the Mermaid's Palace, and there are other nests on Horseshoe Rock and Bastard's Cradle. Without Lord Redwine's fleet, we lack the ships to come to grips with them. Sam is confused by the apparent lack of response from Old Town, saying that he always heard the High Towers were powerful, commanding three times the swords of any of the Tyrell's other bannermen. The captain's reply is blunt. More if he sweeps the cobblestones, but swords are no good against the Iron Men, unless the men who wield them 
know how to walk on water. He goes on to say that Lord Leighton is, quote, locked atop his tower with the mad maid consulting books of spells. Might be he'll raise an army from the deeps. His sons are being more proactive. Baylor is building galleys, Gunther has charge of the harbor, Garth is training new recruits, and Humphrey's gone to Lys to hire cell sales. Some familial connections of interest here are that Humphrey has apparently gone to beg his younger sister Lyness, Jor Mormont's erstwhile wife, to help their cause, and also of note is the fact that Lord Leighton's fourth wife, who is presumably also in the High Tower, is Sam Tarley's aunt, Rhea Florent, and that she is currently sheltering her brother, Alekine Florent, the rightful heir to Brightwater Keep, from which he had been attainted following his support of Stannis Baratheon at the Blackwater. Brightwater was bestowed upon Garland Tyrell by the Iron Throne, so at the very least the relationship between Hightower and Tyrell has become awkward, possibly even strained, and considering that Randall Tarly is married to Alakane's other sister, here's yet more reason to consider the legs of Mace Tyrell's support to be extremely wobbly. The captain of Huntress also expresses his disgust with Cersei for keeping the Redwine fleet leased to the capital. Sam realises that, aside from the military dangers present here, the politics are just as bad. The bitterness of the captain's final words shocked Sam as much as the things he said. If King's Landing loses Old Town and the Arbor, the whole realm will fall to pieces. So, possibly a prescient thought by Samwell there, and now getting back to Euron's goals with regard to the upcoming naval battle. We've already noted that pulling the Red Wine fleet west has left King's Landing defenseless by sea, not to mention Storm's End, Dragonstone, and a host of other places along the coast. The Golden Company have a few ships, but they're not a naval power, although if Orain Waters, the so-called Lord of the Waters, throws in with them, they might be able to at least mount a defense of the Stormlands or Shipbreaker Bay. But as far as we know, Euron remains unaware of their presence. And as for Old Town, note what the captain of Huntress tells Sam. Without Lord Redwine's fleet, we lack the ships to come to grips with them. Should the Red Wine fleet be destroyed, Old Town would be almost as defenceless at sea as the rest of the coastal cities in Westeros. Except, of course, for something Sam notices as Cinnamon Wind approaches up the Whispering Sound. A boom stretched across the harbour, linking two dozen rotted hulks. Just behind it stood a line of warships, anchored by three big Drummonds and Lord Hightower's towering four-decked banner ship, the honour of Old Town. So this obstacle, though not insurmountable, must give one pause when considering the likelihood of Euron taking Old Town by sheer force. The Ironborn would need to overcome not only the Hightower warships, but get around the protective boom. The answer to this puzzle may lie in something Aaron is told in The Forsaken. The red wine fleet creeps toward us. The winds have been against them rounding Dorne, but they're finally near enough to have emboldened that old woman in Old Town. So now, Leighton Hightower's sons move down the whispering sound in hopes of catching us in the rear. So the strategy of the Reach appears to be an effort to capture the Ironborn in a pincer manoeuvre in the Red Wine Straits. But in departing Old Town, the High Towers must have lowered the formidable defence of their protective boom. Since the navy coming down the Whispering Sound is noted to be the sons of Lord High Tower, perhaps we can also conjecture that a large number of the fighting men that might have been present in the city have been loaded onto these warships to bring the battle to the Ironborn. 
Now, had the high towers stayed behind their boom, we might have seen a situation where, after having to fight through the largest navy in Westeros, even if they did so successfully, the Ironborn would then be faced with the defenses at the mouth of Old Town's Harbor, and if they made it past that, they'd be greeted on land by the largest levy of the Reach, likely outnumbering the Ironborn by the thousands. But as it is, the High Towers may have loaded all those men into ships and left their city far too lightly defended. Even if the boom is back in place, two small groups of Ironborn, for example, landed near the boom towers could easily overwhelm any defenders if the bulk of the fighting men had been sent to sea. And so everything in Old Town may hinge upon the success or failure of the confrontation in the Red Wine Straits. However, regarding Euron's goals, it's worth noting that not once has he stated a desire to actually conquer Old Town, and in fact in The Reaver he initially scorned everything the Reach had to offer in terms of conquest. On Oakenshield, after the defeat of the Shield Islands, Red Ralph Stonehouse declared, Old Town is richer, and the Arbor richer still. Redwine's fleet is off away. We need only to reach out our hand to pluck the ripest fruit in Westeros. And Euron replied, Only a craven would steal a fruit when he could take the orchard. Although Euron is specifically speaking of the Seven Kingdoms, indicating once again the breadth of his vision and ambition, his men declare, It is the arbor we want. Now, this is the scene that led to the pivot wherein Euron sent Victarion in the Iron Fleet to Slaver's Bay, staying behind with the bulk of his loyal followers himself to give them exactly what they wanted, plunder and riches. And so, on the one hand, we can't rule out that what Euron is doing in the Reach is simply providing plunder for his followers. But, on the other hand, we have to admit that he might also crave the glory of having taken Old Town, Westeros' largest city and most storied defensive fort, to follow him east. But we also wonder about the risks. These are, after all, Westeros' Vikings, and one thing we know about Vikings in real life is that on land they were ever cautious, always recognizing that their great strength lay in their ships and in the element of surprise. In fact, Asha says as much to Theon in A Clash of Kings. Krakens rise from the sea. Our strength is in our longships. And those ships require men to crew them, and the loss of too many men ashore was a catastrophic risk that few real-life Viking or fictional Ironborn leaders would want to face. Yeah, if Old Town still has a significant force of defenders, even if the fleet at sea is defeated, we think it would be in keeping for the Ironborn to be cautious in their approach. And so, in spite of the fact that Euron is both an atypical Ironborn and generally many steps ahead strategically, we wonder if it isn't in keeping with his ultimate goal of taking the Iron Throne, for which he will need his strong naval force mostly intact, for him to allow his men to simply take the easy fruit, the coastal plunder and the naval victory over Paxter Redwine, and perhaps avoid a direct confrontation in the heavily defended harbour, maybe using guile or distraction, both of which we've seen him employ, to gain entrance to Old Town, perhaps to get something that's inside it. And we could see this eventually being accomplished by means of one or more of the Ironborn's shallow-drafted longships rowing up the Honeywine, and perhaps we might even see that drawbridge at the Isle of Ravens, noted in Sam's Old Town chapter, being raised for the first time in living memory. And whether Euron seeks to gain access to the High Tower itself, or is looking for something secreted inside the Citadel, a strike into the city followed by a swift exit seems much more in keeping with what we expect his ultimate plan to be, a move on King's Landing. 
we'll talk about a couple of things in Old Town that might be of interest to Euron a bit later, but for now we don't want to gloss over the imminent naval battle that we've mentioned so many times. We've made some assumptions about the Ironborn winning this battle, but we should take a look at how this will be accomplished. Euron's fleet, if it's ever numbered a thousand ships, would now be somewhat smaller. Victarion took the Iron Fleet, numbering 93 ships, to Slaver's Bay, while many must have been left behind on the Shield Islands with the men who were granted those lordships by conquest. But let's also suppose that many more ships have been taken in the weeks spent raiding and plundering the Red Wine Straits, so perhaps Euron's navy has returned to a number close to what he started with. Against all that will be the Red Wine fleet of 1,200 ships, with a much smaller fleet out of Old Town sailing up behind, with the goal clearly being to trap the Ironborn in the Straits in a repeat of the Battle off Fair Isle, where Stannis Baratheon smashed Victarion's Iron Fleet during Balon's First Rebellion. But you have to ask yourself, what are the odds of Euron Greyjoy allowing himself to be caught in the same exact trap that humiliated his brother a decade ago and led to the end of the Ironborn dream of independence from the Iron Throne. Well, we'd have to say the odds of that are pretty much zero. And so what we think is much more likely to happen is that Euron will split his large navy into three parts. One will remain in the Straits, the bait for Paxter Redwin from the east, and the Hightower fleet from the west. The other two parts will sail round behind the landmass of the arbour, perhaps even standing out to sea, using whatever technology Euron must have been using in the approach to the Shield Islands, where it was noted he did something unprecedented by sailing so far to the west out of sight of land. And once the men of the Reach have taken the bait, we expect Euron's trap to close, and for the Red Wines and High Towers to be trapped in the Straits exactly as they had intended for Euron himself to be. The rest would be slaughter, as it was with Victarion during Balon's Rebellion. And in support of Euron breaking up his navy, we note that at the end of the Forsaken, when Aaron Greyjoy observes the Ironborn fleet, he sees nothing close to a thousand ships. And so, following what many of us expect to be the utter destruction of Paxter Redwine's fleet, Euron would be free to enact any number of plans, including things we've speculated on here and will be discussing shortly, and almost certainly concluding with a move further eastwards to that ultimate goal of the Iron Throne. What he will find there remains up for debate, but when we come back, we'll be looking at what we think Euron's role in the greater story might be, as we think there's a convincing case to be made that he'll find a close ally in Cersei Lannister. But first, here's an ad from our friends at Davos Fingers Podcast. Okay, so I can set Sandor up against Bran so everyone can feel bad about him murdering another little kid. But after the turmoil of that match, it'll be all for nothing, because Sansa is next, and even Sanders supporters won't vote for him to crush his own little bird in his big brutish paws. Hey, man. So, uh, what you doing? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing. I'm certainly not rigging a song of madness for optimum pain, suffering, woe, and tears. <laughs> Still? Isn't this... Ugh, isn't this wearing a little thin? No. Okay, but you're going to have to put it down. We have a podcast to prepare for. Ugh. Matt, we have a duty to the fandom to bring lighthearted and fun analysis to A Song of Ice and Fire, mixing in our own pop culture comparisons, relatable life stories, and inane segues. All wrapped up in our podcast, Davos Fingers. But Scad, there hasn't even been new material in, like, ages. Like, oh, 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 can we finally cover the show? No. No, just, mm. Matt, we talked about this. We were bringing in people in the fandom to give their opinions on their favorite chapters. New voices that sometimes haven't been heard before, but deserve to be. It's called Meet the Kalasar, remember? Skad, this is starting to sound like an advertisement. 
It is! So if you want some mostly lighthearted A Song of Ice and Fire fun, find Davos Fingers wherever you listen to podcasts. Hash Brown, send it to the internet! I do not propose to climb in bed with that sorry pack of squids. Their turn will come once we have dealt with Stannis. What we require is our own fleet. In making predictions about Euron Greyjoy, it would be folly to ignore some of the shade of the evening visions experienced by Aeron. Such glimpses of prophetic wisdom were the focus in Daenerys' story in The House of the Undying, where the reader and character alike became privy to hallucinogenic visions of the future story, and so expect more of that prescience from Aeron's trippy dreams. And perhaps the most striking of all of those visions is the one of a squiddy, Lovecraftian Euron sat upon the Iron Throne. It says, He saw his brother on the Iron Throne again, but Euron was no longer human. He seemed more squid than man, a monster fathered by a kraken of the deep, his face a mass of writhing tentacles. Beside him stood a shadow in woman's form, long and tall and terrible, her hands alive with pale white fire. Dwarves capered for their amusement, male and female, naked and misshapen, locked in carnal embrace, biting and tearing at each other as Euron and his mate laughed and laughed and laughed. So many have wondered if Daenerys is the woman with Euron by the throne here, but we don't actually see the Victarion Dragonbinder plan working as neatly as either Euron or Victarion hopes, and also can't imagine Euron dramatically derailing Danny's carefully laid arc any time soon, given the many expected plot points she's about to face in Essos and beyond. And so the idea of a Cersei-Euron union of some sort does begin to make some sense, we think. Sometimes predicting the immediate future can be like making a jigsaw puzzle in that pieces will fit together and make sense in ways you didn't necessarily expect. Consider Cersei. We've predicted she'll be in an ascendancy during Winds as she wipes her slate clean and attempts to emulate Tywin, moving away from the tired role of hapless and hopeless regent we saw in A Feast for Crows. If the foretold death of her remaining children comes to pass, it will likely harden her resolve, and what she needs most of all now, especially if she rids herself of the Tyrells by some means, are allies. Cersei is unlikely to align with reputable allies, and so we are looking for someone who is both unscrupulous and is able to offer her something she doesn't already have. Someone who gives her an advantage in a mutually beneficial arrangement. And so consider this. The Crown has been lacking in a decent naval force since the Battle of Blackwater. This deficit is the subject of small council conversation in Cersei IV of A Feast for Crows. Her new Grand Admiral, Orain Waters, says, Fewer than a dozen of our ships survived the inferno on the black water. We must needs restore our strength at sea. Lord Merriweather agrees on the importance of naval strength and asks, Could we make use of the Iron Men, the enemy of our enemy? What would the sea stone chair want of us as the price of an alliance? So, although she rejects that idea outright, that quote that we open the section with, the notion of Cersei allying with the Ironborn is actually laid there. The practical needs of both parties is an obvious match. The Ironborn are indeed the enemies of Cersei's enemies, and Cersei might well be able to offer what the Ironborn, or more specifically their king, desires. Looking back, we also shouldn't forget that once upon a time, following the victory at the Blackwater, Tywin mentioned that he had considered making a marriage alliance between Cersei and Balon Greyjoy in order to bring the Iron Islands back into the fold. 
there would be some irony and also possibly a hint of Cersei emulating her father's stratagems in her pursuing such a course in the Winds of Winter. And taking the notion forward to the Winds of Winter, the dynamics noted in A Feast for Crows are much the same. As we've mentioned, Cersei's new fleet of Dramonds were stolen by Orain Waters in a moment of opportunism, and so the Crown's need for ships in winds will be as desperate as at any point post-Blackwater, especially if Paxter Redwine's fleet is devastated by Euron, as we've predicted. And so the jigsaw puzzle analogy comes into play, with Aegon making inroads in the Stormlands and possibly forging an alliance with Orain Waters, Euron has something Cersei might have dire need for in the Winds of Winter, and the pieces could therefore fit, especially if the Winds of Winter finds Euron himself taking out key parts of Mace Tyrell's power base in the Reach. And back when an Ironborn alliance was being discussed in Feast, it was concluded that they would require some of the North as a reward. If we imagine Cersei reconsidering such an alliance in future, and if this line of conversation really is prefiguring what will occur in winds, Euron will be thinking big. A northern prize would be one thing, but we know Euron has promised the Iron Islanders much and more. At the King's Moot, he surprises Aeron with the boldness of his pitch to the Ironborn electorate. My brother would have you be content with the cold and dismal north, my niece with even less. But I shall give you Lannisport, Highgarden, the Arbour, Old Town, the Riverlands and the Reach, and the Kingswood and the Rainwood, Dawn and the Marches, the Mountains of the Moon and the Vale of Arran, Tarth and the Stepstones. I say we take it all. I say we take Westeros. After committing to this campaign promise, Euron explains that he means to take Westeros as Aegon the Conqueror did, with fire-breathing dragons, those belonging to Daenerys no less. But we think there's an important distinction to be made about Euron's dragon ambitions. and all of his discussion of dragons and their power, he appears to view them as a means to an end, the Iron Throne, rather than the end itself. And so if Euron's immediate plans to form a marriage alliance with Danny are scuppered somehow, he might realize that there's a path of least resistance towards the Iron Throne through Cersei, especially when we consider that Tommen and Marcella could soon be gone from the story. Overall, Euron could be exactly the ally Cersei needs, and she could offer him the position of power he craves. Perhaps he would see her as a stepping stone, and she would think she was using him for his naval capacity, cleverly neutralising the ironborn threat to the throne in a manner Tywin may have approved of. As cynical as that may sound, for their respective ambitions, we think they would pair very well, and so Aeron might have been glimpsing Cersei during his visions, in a scene which echoes Danny's vision of a Westeros torn apart by dwarves, representing the warring factions. And bearing in mind the unmitigated evil both Euron and Cersei seem routinely capable of, any such alliance would surely strike fear into those who would oppose their regime. In the run-up to the long-awaited Others' invasion, a Euron and Cersei match would surely be to the detriment of all of Westeros. And, from a writing perspective, that would be exactly the point. As for Euron's larger role as a villain in the story, there is a considerable amount of evidence that he's been set up to be the big bad of the Winds of Winter. A Game of Thrones had Viserys, and the Clash of Kings and a Storm of Swords had Joffrey. Cersei was despicable in A Feast for Crows, while in A Dance with Dragons, Ramsay Snow came to the fore. Each was set up in the book or books prior to their ascendancy, and each has surpassed the ones that came before in terms of sheer chilling evil. 
Even without the Forsaken, it appeared that Euron was set to replace Ramsay as a bigger, better baddie. Following that chapter, there can be no doubt that here we have one of the worst characters George has yet put to page. But there's still a range of possible ways for this to play out, beginning, as we've said, with the alliance with Cersei, which would line up with what we saw in the HBO show, and going right up to Paul Quentin's Eldritch Apocalypse theory. The Martinian version of Euron Greyjoy, rather than the comic book character we saw in Game of Thrones, could be an entirely convincing evil pirate. Allied with Cersei, the pair could wreak havoc on a Westeros already beset by three of the four horsemen. War, famine and disease stalk the land, while death in the form of the icy others waits in the wings beyond the wall. Opportunists will ever make the most of apocalyptic scenarios, and Cersei and Euron together could seek to rewrite the story of Westeros to suit their own desires. Of all the reasons we see people seeking the power of a throne over the course of A Song of Ice and Fire, it's these two who seek that power for its own sake. Domination will be reward enough should they achieve it, and Euron's dreams of dragons, his talk of flying, and assurance to his brother the priest that he will be his new god is surely an indication that what he dreams of most of all is achieving dominion over others. But is there more to it? Will Euron climb the high tower with the ancient horn Jon Snow found beyond the wall, now in Samuel Tarly's possession, which many believe to be the true horn of winter? Will this horn, not the one Mance Raider found in the Frostfangs, and not the one Euron's creature sounded at the King's Moot, be the instrument that destroys the magic in the wall and unleashes the other's apocalypse on a land already laid low by all the evils humans wreak upon themselves? We have yet to see the ultimate extent of Euron Greyjoy's impact on the narrative. Whether he's simply the next link in a chain of uber-villains that's building towards an ultimate antagonist in the others, or whether he's a prime mover in releasing that evil into the land, only time will tell. Aaron's visions of his brother sitting on the Iron Throne amidst the corpses of all the gods, representing all the cultures of the known world, could be prophetic, or could simply embody a holy man's fears about his godless and terrifying tormentor. We'll leave Euron for a time now to look at the citadel and its cast of curious inhabitants, its pertinent mysteries and plot lines, before looking ahead at what we might see from some of these in the Winds of Winter, remembering that our point of view for all of this will be none other than Samuel Tarly. Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. To start this section, let's first turn our attention to Leo Tyrell, an arrogant bully who is less than kind to his fellow novices. Lazy Leo is curious in that he seems to have forged no links in his chain, nor do we learn why he had been confined to the Citadel as punishment in the Feast for Crows prologue. The others in that prologue seem to loathe him, though Armin calls him my lord with an anxiously deferential manner, and yet he seeks out their company. In his podcast, George characterized Leo as an important character, perhaps because he reappears later in the book. We mentioned that when we see him in Sam's Old Town POV, he's gazing into a candle outside of Marwyn's chambers. Had he been listening at the door, did he continue to do so after Marwyn invited Sam and Alaris, but not Leo, inside? If so, he'd have heard Marwyn's plans to go to Slavis Bay and Sam's story about Aemon, Daenerys and the prophecy. So we wonder... Could Leo be spying for his family, possibly to aid the ascension of his uncle Gorman, or perhaps to keep an eye on certain people? 
Then we have Alaris, another character brought to us on page in the Feast prologue. If the fact that Alaris is Sorella spelled backwards, Sorella being the name of the daughter of Oberyn Martell and a woman from the Summer Isles who's known to be out of communication, playing a game, doesn't convince you who this character really is, then perhaps the fact that Alaris excels with the bow and arrow, the known specialty of Summer Islanders, and also excels at their studies, usually the mark of a highborn upbringing, might sway you. Alaris speaks confidently on matters pertinent to the Dornish, is shown to have expensive taste, and was, quote, always smiling as if he knew some secret jape. We think the jape being that Sorella has followed her father's footsteps in studying at the Citadel is the overwhelmingly favourable explanation. And so for us, the real question is what Sorella's motives are and where they will take her character going forward. First off, the ruse allows her to study at the Citadel as a man, but what does she hope to achieve for her own political cause? At the very least, Dawn now has eyes and ears at the heart of the Citadel, and it will be interesting to see her collecting intel in Samwell chapters, and perhaps off-page she will be secretly corresponding with Doran Martell and her half-sisters. Altogether, Sorella being at the Citadel will likely serve a larger plot purpose, and we look forward to seeing exactly what that is. Another character of intrigue mentioned earlier is Pate. In his A Feast for Crows prologue, real Pate, hoping to abscond with young Rosie, bargained with a mysterious character called the Alchemist. The Alchemist wants to swap gold for an iron key of the Citadel that only Pate has access to. When the pair find a quiet place to carry out their exchange, Pate asks to see the Alchemist's face. Here's the description. He was just a man, and his face was just a face, a young man's face, ordinary, with full cheeks and the shadow of a beard. A scar showed faintly on his right cheek. He had a hooked nose and a mat of dense black hair that curled tightly around his ears. And this description might have triggered a sense of déjà vu for some readers, because we've seen it somewhere before. All the way back in Arya 9 of A Clash of Kings, the young girl is tempted to follow the mysterious Jack and Hagar to Bravos. He reveals himself to be an assassin of the Faceless Men Guild when he does this in front of Aya. Jacken passed a hand down his face from forehead to chin, and where it went he changed. His cheeks grew fuller, his eyes closer, his nose hooked, a scar appeared on his right cheek where no scar had been before. And when he shook his head, his long straight hair, half red and half white, dissolved away to reveal a cap of tight black curls. So the description of Jackin's new face there is very similar to the alchemist. Full cheeks, hooked nose, scar on the right cheek, and tightly curled black hair. It seems like very strong evidence that Jacken is the alchemist, and if you need any further proof, a few lines later, Pate asks the alchemist who he is. The reply? A stranger. No one. Given that Pate dies in his prologue, and that we see him alive again at the end of Feast, it seems to us a solid assertion that Jacques and Hagar is now masquerading as Pate, having infiltrated the Citadel on behalf of the Faceless Men or someone who hired them. Fans wonder if the Elite Assassin's Guild seek to possess a book which came to be introduced by Tyrion in A Dance with Dragons. Here's the quote. Ten years ago, Tyrion had read a fragment of unnatural history that had eluded the blessed Baelor, but he doubted that any of Bath's work had found its way across the narrow sea. And of course, there was even less chance of his coming on the fragmentary, anonymous, blood-soaked tome sometimes called Blood and Fire, and sometimes the Death of Dragons, the only surviving copy of which was supposedly hidden away in a locked vault beneath the citadel. 
And with the Bravosi having such a horrendous history with Valyrian dragon lords and slavery, many fans speculate that the Faceless Men would have good reason to oppose the reemergence of dragons on the current timeline. And so seeking to possess an old tome entitled The Death of Dragons makes perfect sense with that backstory in mind. We can look forward to appearances by New Pate in Samwell Chapters in The Winds of Winter, with the audience fully aware of who he likely really is, while the characters in story remain oblivious. This technique is called dramatic irony in writing circles and adds an extra layer of tension and sometimes comedy to the proceedings. Along with our group of adventurers that we think will be tied closely together in The Winds of Winter, Another point of intrigue at the Citadel is the glass candle burning in Marwyn's chamber in the final chapter of Feast. It's revealed that Marwyn saw Samwell arriving via this magic candle, and so we are left to wonder how it could be used in Marwyn's absence. Could any of the curious collection of characters currently stationed at the Citadel gain some important logistical information, catch a glimpse of an important event, or inhabit someone's dreams and communicate to other characters thousands of leagues away. Now that magic has returned to the world and the glass candles are burning, all of this is within the realms of possibility. It's worth noting that in A Dance with Dragons, Quaithe appears to Daenerys twice. In Danny 2, she appears while Danny is bathing in her pool and tells her the glass candles are burning. And then in the final Daenerys chapter of A Dance with Dragons, she sees Quaithe as an apparition and, quote, her mask is made of starlight. Readers speculate that in this scene in the Dothraki Sea, Quaithe is using a glass candle to communicate advice to Daenerys in her dreams, exemplifying how the use of the obsidian communication device manifests. Yeah, it will certainly be interesting to see if Sam interacts with the glass candle, perhaps to observe concurrent events at the wall. And so there's a wide range of possibilities for Sam's character at the Citadel. He will be studying and bettering himself as an academic and a maester. He is almost certainly going to be researching the others, the Long Night and the Last Hero and the related lore we are all so hungry to know more about. So Sam could be a great vehicle for exposition on ancient and mystical subjects and could also discover important details pertaining to more recent history. Being a lifelong bookworm, an all-around super nerd, we have no doubt George will be selling us the message that knowledge is power, and expect Sam to have a lot of it when he finally leaves the Citadel. But Sam should also be our main point of view for everything that happens in Old Town, including Euron's attack or infiltration. Knowing that this is a possibility, upon their arrival there on Cinnamon Wind, Sam had already resolved that the likely safest place for Gilly and the baby would be with his mother at Horn Hill. And so we also expect that he'll be taking a side trip back to his home. Earlier in the episode, we mentioned the need for Samwell's character to shed some of his internal limitations in order to complete his growth arc and to strive forward into manhood and maturity. One very obvious internal obstacle is his fear of his own father, Randall Tarley. Randall wasn't pleased with Sam being so shy, bookish, and nerdy, and were given various accounts of the resulting abuse Samwell suffered. Yes, it seems that Samwell and Randall could be on a collision course in the Winds of Winter, and this would give Sam the opportunity to rid himself of the long shadow cast upon him by his overbearing and villainous father. We think that if Sam could stand up to Randall in some way and leave Horn Hill with his head held high, it would provide the cathartic high both Sam and the reader are craving. Incidentally, this archetype is referred to in writing circles as meeting your maker, where a showdown with a parent paves way for character development and is also an aspect of the hero's journey. You might recall the instance where Luke Skywalker meets his father or the time Robocop confronted his programmer. 
Those are classic meet your maker moments from pop culture and perhaps that's where Sam's internal story, obviously deeply affected by trauma, is leading us. Of course, if Sam does end up at Horn Hill, he would also reunite with his mother. If there were moments when Randall isn't around, there could possibly be some quite wholesome scenes with Melissa and Gilly and the baby, which no doubt we'd all appreciate. Altogether, by the time Sam arrives back at the wall, expect him to be more knowledgeable and confident, more fit and braver than ever before, although more in the way of personal growth than a complete change of personality. At his heart, he'll always be the Sam that we know and love. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, Sam still has the old warhorn found north of the wall in A Clash of Kings. We mentioned that some fans speculate that this could be the Horn of Winter, although others point out that the others didn't pay special attention to the Horn even when attacking Sam. It's also notable that the Horn of Winter is said to have been blown north of the wall by Joramun himself, and that rather than the wall coming down, we're told repeatedly and rather cryptically that giants were awoken from the earth. What that means remains to be seen, but for a host of reasons, let's mark the old warhorn as something to keep our eyes on during the winds of winter. And so, with a diverse intersection of liars, spies, and masqueraders, the lore exposition we're craving for, magical objects, and a meet-your-maker showdown, the Samuel chapters in the Winds of Winter are set to be full of further mystery, intrigue, and suspense. If you are imagining Sam's time in Old Town to be rather dull and boring, we say, think again, as George has created a lineup that promises to deliver excitement and satisfaction for the reader. Myron wore a chain of many medals around his bull's neck. Save for that, he looked more like a dockside thug than a maester. His head was too big for his body, and the way it thrust forward from his shoulders, together with that slab of jaw, made him look as if he were about to tear off someone's head. Though short and squat, he was heavy in the chest and shoulders, with a round, rock-hard ale belly straining at the laces of the leather jerkin he wore in place of robes. Bristly white hair sprouted from his ears and nostrils. His brow beetled, his nose had been broken more than once, and Sourleaf had stained his teeth a mottled red. Earlier in the episode, we recapped the moment we finally met the mysterious Archmaester Marwyn, a character noted to have authored a compendium called The Book of Lost Books, who is mentioned by a number of people in the story and is clearly designed to leave an impression on our memories. By the end of A Feast for Crows, Marwyn is about to set sail on Cinnamon Wind, bound for Essos on a mission to find Daenerys and perhaps become her official maester or an advisor of some sort, should his mission be successful. Other than the potential dangers inherent in that return trip to Essos, with a naval battle set to take place in the Redwine Straits, We'd have to say that given the fact that Marwyn has previously traveled as far as a shy and in every way presents as a strong and competent character, we have every faith that he will arrive and eventually intersect with Daenerys. The question we could ask is why? What is the purpose of Marwyn's character? Why has George given him this mystical aura? And what exactly will he do if and when he meets Danny? Given our very brief introduction to Marwyn on page, it's a tough question to answer, and so we'll throw out an old idea of ours we've touched upon from time to time. We wonder, albeit with little to no evidence, if Marwyn was the maester who delivered Daenerys on Dragonstone during the terrible storm that inspired her stormborn moniker. Now, first of all, it's notable that Cresson came to Dragonstone with Stannis, so there must have been another maester on the island who aided the birth of Daenerys. 
Marwin might have been favored given his experience in the occult and higher mysteries, a CV which might have gained more approval during a Targaryen reign than it does with the current gray sheep of the Citadel. And remember that if he was the maester at Dragonstone, that he would likely have been an advisor to Rhaegar, who made his home there, after all, and with whom he apparently shared a knowledge of prophecy. Furthermore, George has said we'll know everything there is to know about Robert's rebellion before the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. One of our current blind spots is Dragonstone and Danny's birth. What was happening there? We really have no idea, and there are surely tales yet to be told. With Rhaella dead, Viserys dead, Willem Darry dead, and Danny just a babe then, who is left to be our witness to Dragonstone? If Marwyn was the maester who delivered Danny, he could provide exposition to the reader, as well as convey important details to Danny herself about her own mother, whom she seems to know very little about. And then there are a couple of things Marwyn himself says. Speaking to Sam of the reasons Aemon Targaryen had been allowed to stagnate at the wall instead of being elevated to Archmaester, as his esteemed kinsman Vagon Targaryen had been in the reign of Jaehaerys and Alysanne, Marwyn states, His blood was why he could not be trusted, no more than I can. And so we wonder if this purposeful aligning of himself with the Targaryens has to do with mere philosophical connection or some other deeper connection. And the other thing he says that might indicate he was somehow connected with Targaryens in the past, even if only by virtue of correspondence with or familiarity with the ideas of Rhaegar and Aemon, is his well-known statement on the nature of prophecy. Quoting Gorgon of Old Gis, Marwyn says to Sam, Prophecy will bite your prick off every time. It strikes us that if Marwyn was a confidant of Rhaegar's, this quote being his response to hearing of Aemon's conviction that Daenerys is the fulfilment of the prophecy Rhaegar had been so concerned with, could be him directly speaking to his own past, an ironic commentary on how deeply wrong Rhaegar and others may have been. Altogether, using a sort of speculative deduction, we can imagine the great benefits to the narrative if Marwyn was the Dragonstone Maester. Perhaps when Danny, Viserys, and William sailed off to Bravos, making their escape, Marwyn decided to undertake the journey which found him collecting book fragments as well as studying and teaching in Ashai. So Marwyn's voyage to the east might also fit nicely into this speculative timeline, and indeed, perhaps his quest was inspired by the baby he delivered, born amidst the salt and smoke of Dragonstone, as described in Prophecy. Whether we're right or wrong about Marwyn, we do expect an intriguing story to be revealed following his arrival at Slaver's Bay. Marwyn the Mage is certainly a character we can all be excited to learn more about. They bound Aaron damp hair tight with strips of leather that would shrink when wet, clad only in his beard and breech clout. The crow's eye spoke a command. A black sail was raised, lines were cast off, and silence backed away from shore to the slow beat of the oar master's drum her oars rising and dipping and rising again, churning the water. Above them, the castle was burning, flames licking from the open windows. So we've talked a lot in this second half of the episode about Euron Greyjoy and about Samuel Tarly and other secondary characters from Old Town. One character we haven't mentioned in quite a while is Aeron Greyjoy, the point of view of the Forsaken, last seen strapped to the brow of Euron's silence, as the Ironborn prepared for their battle against the Redwine fleet. While, given his physical position, as well as Euron's persistent threats about the value of priest's blood, it's quite difficult to see a way for Aeron to survive past his next POV, which has been confirmed, 
we think it's important to note that should he perish, there would be no immediate POV to Euron, barring events that bring Sam and Euron into much closer proximity than we'd hope. So we wonder if there will be some twist that allows the Dampere to survive, to continue to show us Euron's bloody path, or if Euron will fall off page again until he crosses paths with another point of view in another region. Either seems equally likely at this time, though we don't necessarily expect Aaron Greyjoy to survive for too long. And speaking of Greyjoy brothers, whom we don't expect to survive for too long, we last mentioned Victarion Greyjoy sailing eastwards with the Iron Fleet. Euron has charged his brother with finding Daenerys and her dragons and bringing them back to Westeros, where it is Euron's intention to marry Danny and take advantage of those dragons to win the Iron Throne. We've mentioned that we don't see this going very smoothly at all. And in fact, Euron's shade of the evening spawned vision of the longships of the Ironborn adrift and burning on a boiling blood-red sea from the Forsaken seems to us to be a view of Victarion's fleet, defeated and destroyed, either during or following the Battle of Fire in Slaver's Bay. We've mentioned in this episode that Euron, ever the opportunist, may find he doesn't need the dragons in order to gain his prize. And so, should his younger brother fail in his mission to Daenerys, that possible alliance with Cersei may play out. And in the next installment of this series, we'll be taking a long look at the events in Slaver's Bay for which we have a virtual bonanza of preview content, with one Victarion, two Barristan, and two Tyrion chapters either released or summarised. Expect this one to be epic, and in the meantime, we encourage you to revisit our Battle of Fire episode to brush up on the goings-on in Slaver's Bay. And so we'll say farewell until next time. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed this latest installment in our Winds of Winter Primer series. We'll be back soon with another episode looking at what's happening in Slaver's Bay. But now it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R. R. Martin for giving us bad guys like Euron and good guys like Sam Tarley. And thanks to Kevin MacLeod and Kai Angle for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Heartfelt thanks to AJ, Aegon the Sixth, Alex, Oakenfist, Nessie the Questing Beast, Arion, Brian, Camille, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Christine, Maddie and Jessica, Clay, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Crimson Kate, Dag Blabla, Dan S., Dimitri B., Dennis, Direwolf, Eric, Esme, Emily of the Eerie, Ezra, Felix, Sir Gladworth, Greg, History of Westeros, Iden, Ingvald, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Brendan Beefish, Goldie Juke, Jim McGeehan of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, Winter's King, John Aris, writer of the Ice Dragon Scenarion, The White Storm, Lady Julie Beth of Tarth, Judson, Catherine, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Brash Candy, Kevin, Tree Girl, Sir Galahu of What, Knight of the Laughing Tree, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lauren, Lemmy B, Lord Young of the Ghostwoods, Monaro Geek TV, Maria, and our cohort of Mats. Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, the first of his name, and Matt L, the second of his name. And thanks as well to Lady Beatrix of House Grey, Melinda, Maester Mary, Michael M, Mitchell, Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Paul B, and Paul H, Richard, Sam, Scott Greenseer, Scott, Sir Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Sir Swift, Shari, Sheila, Soren, Spentrails, That Shiny Bastard, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Theo, the Cannibal of Casterly Rock, Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Virginie, Quar and Halfhand, Woodside for Life, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer us to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access.